attention. Welcome to the LSU Sports Insider, brought to you by the journalists at The Advocate, NOLA.com and the Times-Picayune. Parent Keys here hanging out with Cokie Riley, our LSU baseball beat writer, and Wilson Alexander for uh, the lo- what seems like a long time. I guess it hasn't been that long, but it seems like it's been a long time. She's been sitting in the middle chair. I think it's been a while. I Has don't know. It? There hasn't been a whole lot of football stuff going on. Yeah, no, and there's been plenty else <laughs> yeah. uh, for us to concern ourselves with. Uh, uh, if you're looking for a, uh, a breakdown of uh, the LSU women in the NCAA tournament, you can uh, check out our previous podcast. Uh, the same with uh, the LSU gymnastics team, uh, as well as Maggie McNeil, who is a uh, an LSU swimmer uh, from Canada who's going to uh, make a run at a second gold medal at the Summer Olympics this year. If you want to check out any of that, please check out our previous podcast. But uh, today we're going to talk LSU baseball coming off a disappointing weekend in Starkville and then a get-right game against uh, the young lads from Ruston, Louisiana. They took care of them uh, the other night. And, of course, we will talk about LSU spring football because spring football is underway. And we've got uh, some news from the SEC as well about uh, future scheduling, which is going to get disappointing to most. But uh, I don't know. Is that your sense? Yeah. It's kind of like a womp womp. Yeah. It's very anticlimactic and, (laughs) again, disappointing. Okay. They're going to play all the same teams again. Well, just kick it down the road. You know, at some point you're going to actually have to stop kicking. So, anyhow, we will get into all that. Uh, But, of course, uh, first a little bit of business here uh, as As always, we are here every Monday and Thursday on the LSU Sports Insider Podcast. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever other finer podcasts are found. Uh, But uh, more more specifically and uh, uh, perhaps more importantly, you can find us on all our social channels, specifically uh, our YouTube channel, LSU Tigers on NOLA.com. You can check us out there live. If you don't find us there live, you can find us after the fact on that same YouTube channel. So please subscribe. Uh, Please subscribe to The Advocate if you have not done so already. You know where to find all our writers' great work. That's at The Advocate. Uh, We've always been known as the number one destination for LSU sports, of course. So uh, so support your local journalists, whether that's in print or digital, uh, to sign up to subscribe for the advocate subscribe to the advocate excuse me you go to the advocate.com slash subscribe and uh and please sign up for our lsu newsletter you can uh that way you won't uh you won't miss a headline won't miss a beat won't miss a moment you can get all the great headlines uh, delivered straight to your inbox and to sign up for that lsu newsletter you go to the advocate.com slash LSU newsletter. And of course, we are here uh, every Monday and Thursday brought to you by our friends at Champion Wealth Strategies. One day I'm going to learn this message uh, and so I don't have to read from it. But until then, (laughs) here it goes. (laughs) Champion Wealth Strategies is brought to you, uh, excuse me, Champion Wealth Strategies is a national financial services firm specializing in the capital markets, securities, insurance, 401ks, and college and retirement planning. Our broker dealer is LPL financial member FINRA SIPC. As you know, investments are not FDIC insured may lose value and have no bank guarantee to learn more contact champion wealth strategies at championwealthstrategies.com and plan like a champion today see that's the majesty of a live read we certainly appreciate champion wealth strategies being with us uh, all year long uh so gentlemen uh let's get into it first uh first things first um Obviously, Koki, it's uh, it's baseball season. SEC play started uh, last week. Uh, the LSU fan base, rightly so, is always fired up for the start of uh, for for SEC play. But uh, probably thinking that they were going to have a better showing in Starkville, Mississippi State, uh, not believed to be one of the top contenders in the West, and yet they take two out of uh, three against LSU, including a run rule game. Uh, if, quite frankly, and this is where to start. Obviously, is is the pitching staff. Uh, as you know, and as you've uh, detailed many times at theadvocate.com, uh, it was it was assumed that this year's team was going to be heavy on great starting pitching and a, and a pretty solid bullpen, and maybe not quite as potent uh, at the plate. And uh, well, long story short, here let's just read this thing off, and uh, please, Koki, co- co- correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the s- three starting pitchers uh, in Starkville, uh, thirteen and a third innings. 21 hits, uh, a composite 877 ERA, seven walks, nine strikeouts. It's not what you would call a dominant effort out of three guys. Uh, just to, to, wh- not where, great, Bob. <laughs> not great, Bob. That's correct. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite lines, one of my favorite series, incidentally. <laughs> what uh, What do you make of all this, uh, Koki? Just where, where do the Tigers stand? Yeah, um, it was definitely surprising. It's definitely not something that I don't think anyone really expected. Uh, the fact that the pitching staff would struggle this much and yet the offense was actually 
a slight positive, like yeah. a slight plus for them. Um, not good enough to like sweep the series, but it wasn't. They, they were good enough to win the series with their offense, and I thought it was kind of a key. And if their defense and their pitching had you know played up to the standard, they would have won that series, and that just simply wasn't the case. And uh, I mean, they were just having a lot of issues getting in front getting ahead in counts and mm-hmm. not because necessarily because they were, you know, missing the strike zone a bunch. I mean, that was a slight issue for them, but the bigger issue was Mississippi state was jumping on any first pitch strike, uh, mm-hmm. first pitch fastballs, especially second pitch fastballs stuff that's in the zone that they can, that they can drive quite frankly. And, um, they did a good job of sitting on what they wanted to get and they did a really good job of taking advantage of that. And I think some, some credit should be given to Mississippi state for that. But at the same time, like, LSU needs to learn that it, it, it getting ahead of the count is, is important, but maybe don't you know group a fastball right down the middle that could get you know driven for extra base hits or singles, a lot of solid singles, and um, they didn't give up a ton of home runs in this series, but they gave up a lot of hard hit singles, right. and that that's kind of a reflection of um, you know Mississippi State again just taking advantage of. Uh, I guess the perpetual strike throwing that LSU showed early in the season. So, I mean, it's obviously throwing strikes is important, but how you throw them and when you throw them um, is, is sometimes just as important. And I think that's something that was definitely, that definitely stood out to me this week. You want to hit the black and not, not hit middle, middle every single time. Yes. yes. Uh, Luke Holman, we'll start there. Obviously the Friday night starter four and two thirds innings, Two earned runs, but that's uh, quite misleading. I think you would probably yes. agree. Ten hits, five, uh, five, earn, uh, excuse me, five runs in all. One walk, three strikeouts. So tell me, uh, tell me, tell me what you thought about that. Yeah, uh, again, a lot of singles, a lot of hard hit singles in that game. Um, he wasn't getting a lot of swings and misses, and and in, the, in that fastball issue that I sort of brought up, that kind of really started with him. And Holman's fastball was kind of unhittable the first in his first four starts. Texas didn't really have much of a chance for him to hit it. Um, he kind of had, in some ways, he's kind of a similar profile pitcher as to uh, as the Ty Floyd last year, where he really uh, thrives throwing that high fastball um, and has pretty solid breaking stuff. And he and he does it very consistently, uh, maybe more consistently than F- Floyd did last season. The highs of Floyd, I think, are arguably higher in that induced vertical break that he has in the fastballs are arguably greater than what Holman does but Holman just does has I guess in some ways a similar profile and an extra breaking pitch but does it again more consistently and um, Mississippi State just wasn't fooled by that pitch and and you saw him trying to adjust throughout the game by you know kind of pitching backwards a little bit you know throwing breaking a lot of sliders early in counts um, and he kind of held on but he didn't totally hold on mm-hmm. right and that he only gave up two earned runs um, and uh, but again, gave up 10 hits and heading into the game, he had only given up eight hits all season. So right. it kind of tells you how dramatic of a shift it was on Friday. Strikeout total, certainly not as high as, as yes. most of those other stars too. Three or four. Yeah, three, three, which speaks okay. to sort of his, uh, the swing and miss pitches weren't there. Um, uh, let's, let's work backwards a little bit because, um, you know, I think we, Maybe the biggest surprise of the weekend was Gage Jump. So, uh, but I want to I want to get to Thatcher Hurd first. Three innings, seven hits, seven earned runs, three walks, three strikeouts. We've seen we saw this last year and s- thought we were going to maybe start seeing it again this year, where he he got off to a rocky start, mm-hmm. and then obviously toward the end of last year he was in great shape, uh, and then he got off to a, what seemed like a rocky start this year. And again, seemed like he was about to turn the corner, and that well, obviously that didn't happen up in Starkville. Yeah, and uh, this this start kind of encapsulated that because right. he got gets off to a rough start, gives up three runs in the first inning, and then he throws three scoreless innings. It seemed like he had sort of, um, I, I guess, you know, calmed things down to a point where the he, he could you know last five innings and give them a chance in the game and right when LSU had tied it at three heading into the fifth inning he was up he's up two home runs and four runs including a three-run home run to Dakota Jordan and um and when he needs that big pitch or when he needs that big out he just can't quite seem to get it right and it's hard to really pinpoint exactly why um so like for example like the three runs he gave him in the first inning that all came with two outs mm-hmm. um but 
you know, he leaves one pitch here or one pitch there over the plate and they start peppering balls down the third base line that Tommy White just simply doesn't have a chance to grab. Like, I think stated three doubles down the third base line in that one inning, which is odd. Right. Um, and then, and then uh, with Dakota Jordan up with two runners on in the fifth inning, um, he can't quite locate the fastball. He falls down to a 3 0 count and then he has to get back in the count throwing breaking balls. And that's what Jordan was waiting for. And he, takes a slider and or curveball one or the other and just you know drills it out the center field three run home run changes changes the complexion of the game just like that and um and they can't quite recover them because you know hunter hines the very next hitter hits a solo home run and they take a four run lead so um that's the seven runs right there in a nutshell because outside of that he was actually okay you 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 mentioned uh two out rbis for mississippi state and i I've, i meant to make a note of this and i apologize because i didn't uh, i don't have it in front of me but didn't mississippi state sort of feast on on uh on LSU the same way on Friday, getting a lot of two out key hits with, with runners on base. Or am I misremembering yes. that? Yes, yeah. that's 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 exactly right. And and they were there was a lot of and, and I guess another problem that LSU staff had outside of just um, getting really jumped on early on in counts with their fastball was they had trouble you Got know finish finishing at bats right kill pitches as mm-hmm. they would like to say. So uh, and I think that's a good example of you know not getting that key out with two strikes when you're ahead of the count not, you know you know walking a batter when you're already up oh two like stuff like that was happening you know throughout the weekend quite a bit as well um uh, so let's so uh, let's again we'll go go to the to the middle game now and discuss gage jump who i think more or less you'd say uh had not given any indication any previous indication that he would turn in a performance like this three and two-thirds innings four earned runs three walks three strikeouts again the strikeout number is uh, pretty low and obviously if your starting pitcher is only going three and two-thirds unless you're the tampa bay rays and you believe in openers <laughs> and pitching bullpen games which lsu doesn't uh, necessarily want to do uh particularly with these starters anyway that's that's that had to have been a big surprise all, all three of these are a big surprise but jump in particular yeah yeah um in some ways yes in some ways no because he hadn't really been challenged competition wise yet and he'd only had two real full starts heading into this weekend he had like a mini start in his second appearance and he came out of the bullpen in his first appearance so Mm -hmm. he'd only thrown i want to say 13 and a third heading into this past um and heading into this past weekend so um this was a definitely step up in competition for him and it was his first time you know pitching in the road in this sort of environment before um but in just in terms of his pre-year performance like to me it was a little bit what i think what was kind of surprising to me is that his velocity seemed a little bit low um he was really sitting around more 92 93 instead of like hitting 95 which you kind of usually does maybe that has to do the fact that it was a tad bit colder um, outside, or I, I honestly don't really know like the real answer to that. Um, it just seemed like his stuff wasn't playing as sharp as it had in his last couple starts. Again, I don't totally know why. Maybe maybe I'm reading that wrong too, but um, that's what it seemed like to me. Uh, but yeah, like I mean, sort of the same problem that really every LSU pitcher had was, um, you know, guys just jumping on stuff early and, and just taking advantage of any sort of mistake pitch and uh, especially you know those fastballs are in the counts and the lack of kill pitches later in the counts um, just kind of a consistent issue and he was kind of part of that uh, throughout the weekend I guess what kind of well, we'll get to uh, what this means for LSU moving forward it may mean a lot may not mean much of anything it may just be a bad weekend we'll discuss Florida and LSU obviously huge weekend coming up uh, here at the box in, uh, Florida number six in the nation LSU for the moment number five in the nation uh, but before we get to that you mentioned the offense uh, sort of doing mostly doing its job and certainly somebody who did more than more than his job was uh, Tommy Tanks. Tommy Tanks is, uh, sort of looked like more like himself. He certainly looks like he's sort of back in the swing of things. Nine of 18 for the weekend, or excuse me, nine of 18 for the past four games, including Louisiana Tech, the midweek game. Nine of 18, nine RBIs, seven runs, four homers. Um, that'll take you a long way. We can, you can't expect him to keep that up the, over that four-game <laughs> pattern, obviously, but that'll take you a long way, and it's good to see him uh, be the All-American type player that you were hoping. Yeah, I, I, I think... Those numbers at the plate, I think, is part of a reflection of like just the positive regression we were expecting from right. him at some point. He's too talented. He's too good for to not start drilling home runs again, especially since he's healthy. And I think we kind of forgot about the fact that he, again he had not swung a bat for six and a half months um, before coming back. Uh, 
for, for this upcoming season because of the shoulder surgery that he had over the off season. So um, it just sometimes just takes a while to, you know, get reps, get at bats and um, kind of find that patience, find that swing again, because I think part of the problem for him during the non-conference play was he got just a little bit too impatient at the play. He was rolling over a lot of breaking balls to the outside. He had some trouble with some of the high fastballs. Um, and those are two things that you can sort of, you know, point to rust and mm-hmm. again, just not getting as many offseason reps. And uh, you just didn't see that problem at all against Mississippi State. And you really didn't see it against Louisiana Tech and went four for five and another home run. So and, um, he looks great again. Right. And just, you know, to put a little bit of a finer point on this, you know, injuries and, and you know, recovery sort of notwithstanding also, you know, every hitter in the history of baseball has had a rough patch here and there. And you, you yeah. expect them to sort of, you know, go back to the mean for whatever their mean should be. So uh, let's move on. Let's talk about Florida and LSU, a rematch, if you will. Obviously, two very different teams now, uh, but a rematch, if you will, of last year's College World Series finals. Seven o'clock on Friday, six o'clock Saturday, two o'clock on Sunday to finish off at the box this weekend. Well, uh, again, let's go back to the starting pitching. I hate to harp on that, but, you know, <laughs> look, the, the, the three starting pitchers, you know, sometimes, look, you just had a bad weekend. And it's maybe it's even a little bit easy to forget now because LSU did win the national championship last season. They were not hot uh, going sort of that second, you know, the second half, the back half of the SEC schedule. They went through a rough patch. Lost a series to Mississippi State. Yeah, and wound up okay and obviously turned it around. A Mississippi State team, and they were at home instead of being on the road. That's correct. And so, look, these things happen. It's baseball. It's not football. And uh, the best teams are going to lose. The best major league teams are going to lose 60-odd times in a season. So maybe that's all this is. But what happens? What happens if the starting rotation doesn't put forth a a great effort here? Uh, You know, this weekend is, is, uh, you know, is this is that when the red flares should go up? I guess it depends how rough it gets. Um, And I think we should temper it a little bit because, again, Florida, their strength of their team is offense. Mm -hmm. Um, This is probably a more talented offensive team than we saw saw against Mississippi State. Um, Florida really, in general, has been a really tough team to sort of gauge how good they are because they win. They they start off the non-conference play with with six losses, which is a lot. Um, And then... They face Texas A&M, an undefeated team. They win the series two out of three, which yep. seems like, oh, they're back. They're fine. And then they lose to Jacksonville on Tuesday. Mm-hmm. So we don't really know how good or bad they are. <laughs> and I think the one consistent thing about them is that their pitching has not been very good. Mm-hmm. Um, Kate Fisher, who was one of their top relievers last year, moved up to their Friday role, and he just hasn't quite worked out there. And uh, Jack Caglione's pitched better for them as the Sunday guy, and he's obviously a two-way star. And he's probably their best hitter as well. Um, and he's pitched better, but really outside of that, they just haven't gotten the performances out of the bullpen or in the starting rotation that you'd like to see, um, whether that be against A&M or even or against non-conference teams that they should be beating easier. So um, I think that's something to keep an eye out for because even if LSU's pitching isn't great in this weekend, they could maybe still slug their way to winning the series because, again, Florida's rotation just hasn't been great. So this could be a pretty high-scoring series in a way, especially if LSU's bats, again, continue the slight, you know, gradual, you know, off- offensive uh, upward trajectory that they what we've seen the last weekend or two. So, um, yeah, I think that's something to keep an eye out for. But I do also want to just, like, quickly touch on the bullpen because technically do. I think they, yeah. had an e- they had an even higher year right in the starters this yeah, weekend. Yeah, Justin Lower certainly didn't didn't uh, get him off to a great start during the weekend. Yeah, he gives up the three-run home run that kind of opens up the game on Friday. And then they had a – and then the bullpen um, slash gauge jump had a 9-1 to one lead on Saturday. And they come this close to blowing the game. Um, it goes 9-8 in the eighth inning. They had uh, Mississippi State runners on first and second with one out. And you just feel like, oh, this is it. This is going to be it right That's here. Right. And then Chris Little gets – forces the double play. They get him out of the inning. And now it's kind of curtains because Nate Ackenhausen came to the ninth and did his job. Um, but, you know, just a lot of shaky stuff from a lot of different guys out of that bullpen a lot of inherited runner scoring um some walks here and there and uh and then uh, of course the, the whole blow up on uh sunday when uh they were they they had been down by four after the after the all the home runs that her gave up um then they cut it to two with tommy's home run and then all of a sudden it just a little comes back and it comes back on Sunday and pitches and he isn't half quite as sharp as he was on Saturday. And, and, and that sort of, you know, 
like divulges into more runs and all of a sudden Nick Bronzini's in the game trying to stop them from getting run rolled. <laughs> so it, it was just an avalanche of issues with the bullpen. Um, and again, a lot of the same similar issues that the starters had and all really all the pitchers had when it comes to the counts and their fastballs and, you know, not getting to kill pitches with two strikes. And then a nice ba- a bounce back game in fairness. Now, yes. obviously a, a step down in competition level from, uh, from the SEC in La Tech, but La Tech is a respectable program. Program, certainly, and you throw a lot of pitchers out there, as is often the case during a midweek game. You throw a lot of pitchers out there, and they all get mm-hmm. more or less get the job done. Uh, eleven to one, is that correct? Yes, eleven, 11 to one. one win, eight innings. Um, Cam Johnson looked sharper, which I think is a good sign for them. Sure, uh, just for his development in, in general. They're he's they're really it's kind for of his, a slow play for him for his potential and for the potential that it holds for LSU in terms yeah. of exactly. long term. Exactly. I was going to ask. I mean, there was so much buzz around him. In the preseason, what, where is he at at this point for those who have maybe haven't been paying close attention? Yes. Um, I, the key for him, it's very simple. It's throwing strikes. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has all the talent in the world. He hit 96. I mean, caught a kid looking, hit 96 last night with his fastball. Perfect pitch on the corner. I was like, wow, no one can really do that on this team <laughs> except for him. A few um, people in college can, frankly. Yeah, I mean, exactly. There's a handful. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, it's just, again, he had major major control issues when he when his first appearance and it has slowly gotten better um since then uh and that's just the key for him just to throw strikes because when he gets that thing in the zone it's really hard to hit because it's 96 with great extension from the left side and it's just that's just really hard to see and then he can mix that in with a breaking ball that looked pretty sharp this pat on tuesday and then yeah it's uh it's 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 uh, definitely impressive, and uh, you know it, another guy who kind of stood up, stood out a little bit was Aiden Moffitt, and they've they, uh, Jay Johnson sort of talked about wanting to throw him more in weekend situations. He probably throws harder than anyone else on the team. He can get mm-hmm. the ball up to ninety nine when he's when he's really on. Um, again, he's kind of somewhere in that you need to see strikes from him and sort of like the, the consistency of mechanics and, and that sort of stuff. Um, so they have a lot of different options, even if the guys that they're throwing right now aren't necessarily working. And they're willing to go to those options. Like like Will Helmers pitched this past weekend. That would not have happened last year. Um, but he, they have seen like real improvement from him since moving him to uh, the other side of the rubber. So, uh, yeah, like I... I I, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw one or two of those sort of guys, you know, the, the Cam Johnsons, the Aiden Moffats this this weekend, even. Go, oh, I thought you were, you were going to say something. Okay. No. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> uh, this is uh, this is the LSU Sports Insider brought to you by the journalists at The Advocate, NOLA.com, and The Times Picayune. Please subscribe to The Advocate if you have not already, whether that's print or in digital. To do that, you go to theadvocate.com slash subscribe. Uh, and stay up to date with uh, all the sports that are going on. Everything's going on underneath the sun right now at LSU, including football, which we're about to get into. Uh, it's a lot to try to keep track of. Uh, and we've got uh, possibly a new arena situation going on. If you, uh, if, you subscribe, if you subscribe to The Advocate and or The uh, Advocate newsletter, uh, The Advocate's LSU newsletter, uh, you can stay up to date on all that stuff. It's all sent to your inbox, to your desktop, to your email, anywhere you go. Uh, and so to sign up for that LSU newsletter, you go to theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. Uh, we are here every Monday and Thursday on the LSU Sports Insider on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever other finer podcasts are found. Uh, and we are here uh, on all our social channels, specifically our YouTube channel, LSU Tigers on NOLA.com. You can catch us there live. Uh, if you don't catch us there live, you can catch us after the fact anytime on that YouTube channel. So please subscribe. Uh, and we are brought to you, of course, uh, every Monday and Thursday by Champion Well Strategies. To learn more, please go to championwellstrategies.com and plan like a champion today. Uh, so let's talk, uh, Wilson, let's talk a little bit of LSU football, let's LSU spring football. Uh, yeah, it's baseball season. It's March Madness. LSU women's basketball about to play. You know, everybody's worked, worked in their brackets, but football never ends. Hell with that. Football, <laughs> never never ends. Ends. football, football is king in this state and always will be. So. <laughs> New arena. Uh, matter, so. Football. <laughs> football, uh, football. Yeah. Well, so first things first, I thought it was um, uh, kind of illuminating. Uh, frankly, Wilson, you had something up at theadvocate.com just the other day. Uh, it's still there, obviously. Uh, no, we pro- took it down. Uh, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> One time only. Um, no, uh, about Brian Kelly just saying that this is, this is the closest, and this is 
team number three now, year number three for mm-hmm. Brian Kelly at LSU. And this this third edition, at least at this point, seems like it's the closest to being the most player-led of the three teams, uh, which, as we've seen over and over in the course of LSU football history, uh, the best teams, the teams that wind up accomplishing the most, all those teams had a similar story about how the players all got together on their own accord in the offseason, and again during the summer to go run routes, to go lift, to go train and do all that stuff, and the players themselves uh, held each other accountable. So I thought that was pretty illuminating and just uh, curious if you could just sort of expand on that a little bit. Yeah, the last you know Kelly said on uh, the first, I guess, or maybe second day of spring practice was that very thing that he thinks this is the closest to being a player-led team he's had at LSU, and that's something that Brian has tried to you know foster ever mm-hmm. since he got here. There's a few ways LSU's gone about doing it. They have these things called SWAT teams, which we've gone over on the podcast before. Basically, you know, captains on the team are all picking players on the team. They have to hold them accountable to fill out these daily wellness questionnaires. They accumulate points for certain things, even as simple as just being on time and things like that. And um, Garrett Nussmeyer said yesterday that one example, some evidence that he's seen that of what Kelly is saying is that um, the staff had basically a sheet printout the other day of um, kind of the results of those questionnaires and some of these things that they do. And um, Garrett said that they had the fewest misses that they've had in like a really, really long time. Hmm. And that that's a that's a good sign if everybody is kind of buying in to what, you know, Kelly sells. And not only that, though. That the other player, like the leaders on this team, the Mason Taylors, the Nussmeyers, all these guys who've been in the program now for a few years, are making sure that everybody else on the team is doing that, mm-hmm. and that's really what is a great sign. Um, it, you know, because Mason Taylor told this story yesterday. As soon as they got back from the bowl game, basically, and the off season started, Garrett started organizing throwing sessions right. with all the offensive skill players. And because I asked Mason, you know, what's the evidence that you've seen of this being as close to a player led team as Brian Kelly's saying? And he said, Nuss stepping in. Mm-hmm. Like, Brian, like, you know, Garrett Nussmeyer coming in here and really kind of asserting himself in that role and getting everybody on the same page and taking on that leadership. And, you know, Garrett sort of um, doesn't want that spotlight on him, doesn't want it to be all about him and what he's doing as a starting quarterback. But it is important as the starting quarterback that he's doing these things. He said that it's, you know, this is his first time as a starter, but he's been a starter his entire life up until he got to LSU right. for the last few years. And that this is, in his mind, just what you do as a starting quarterback and what you do as an offense in the offseason. You get together and you throw and you you have these throwing sessions and you work on routes. You watch film together. You get with your offensive linemen and, you know, talk about protections and get on the same page. And that this is just a part of a natural part of the offseason. But it's still notable that it's happening. Right. It might seem to him as something that's very like, this is just what you do, and this is all about us as an offense getting better. It's not about me taking control. But for Mason Taylor, it was like the proof that this is a player-led team, that Garrett is making this stuff happen. And then a lot of it, you know, according to Mason anyway, is kind of coming from him as the quarterback. And so all of those things kind of work it together um, to try to make this a player-led team, which um, according to Garrett and to Mason, and this is something we've heard from LSU's players a lot over the last few years, it's kind of the company line, um, is that if those things are happening, then the results in the field should follow. That's something that Brian Kelly talks about a lot. And so maybe that is a positive sign here heading into year three as they try to become a team that is more than just, you know, back-to-back 10-win seasons. Uh, that's, that was going to be my next point. Actually, I thought it was illuminating that uh, Nussmeyer – Mason Taylor and Brian, you expect it from Brian Kelly, and I suppose you expect. I mean, what else are the players going to say if you, want, if you if you want to be yeah. if you want to be uh, uh, you know a skeptic about these types of things or cynic? But uh, it was interesting. I think it's illuminating. They all say, "Look, ten and two is great. Ten and three is great, but it's it's not what we're gunning for here at LSU. It's what you want to hear." And I grant you, it's spring, and of course you're going to have a, a summer where we're all going to say, "Hey, they're lifting and they're doing great and they're doing yeah. it." You know, because no national championship. That's right. Yeah, no, but nobody has ever said in the <laughs> off season that these guys are just sort of hanging out and they're lazy boys. Nonetheless, these are the things that you want to hear. Uh, you know, certainly from a program that seems like it's on the precipice of potentially maturing. Yes, it is what you want to hear. I mean, it, it's just a mindset shift from what. LSU was at over the last couple of years coming off a losing season for the first time in decades you know things have gotten stabilized with back-to-back 10 win seasons um, but they need to continue to build on that you know another nine and three regular season with a win in a bowl game that's outside the new year's six at this point in year three isn't really going to cut it you know are they off the 12 team playoff especially with that Mm. and so 
you know, that's still a realistic possibility. I mean, right. you know, we got to see how the, everything plays out. Um, but it, it, that is just shows like where the program's at now going into year three. Right. Uh, it's no longer about for this team, you know, just getting back to that sort of 10 win threshold and being competitive, being a top 15 team again. Um, that isn't, you know, sweating out bowl eligibility at the end of the year like they were in 2020 and 2021. Mm-hmm. Um, it's about truly being competitive for championships right and especially now in an expanded playoff being in those playoff spots and um that's something that the players have taken to heart you know especially you look at sort of the leadership group on this team now um you're looking at garrett nussmeyer who's been in the program for you know this will be his fourth year mm-hmm. you're looking at mason taylor who's been here now for two uh this will be his, full, third, year. Yeah, this will be his third year greg penn a linebacker who's um you know going to be a senior and um as a group they I think have a real thirst to truly accomplish something because as a team, you know, you go back to 2019 when else won its last championship. Like this is a group of guys that, I mean, there's the only person maybe that was on that team at this point is Josh Williams. Mm-hmm. who's back, uh, you know, because he's got the COVID extensions and everything. Right. It's like, this group has not been through that. Like they've went to an SEC championship game, most of them, but they didn't um, obviously didn't win in right. that game. And so they're trying to really push this program forward. Uh, this is, goes back a long ways now, but J- one of the things that Jerry DiNardo was famous for saying, and, it, and it's true, that you know th- the distance between you know being just going, going from mediocre to good is one thing. The distance from going good to great, it, that's that's a that is a huge, that's much much bigger step. Yeah. And so, but now you've got players who presumably that's the next step they want to take, and they're you know oh. presumably willing willing to sell out, so to speak, to do it. Oh, for sure. I mean, they've been obviously that's not to discount from anything they've done the last two years. Like the LSU, right. you know, really thought it had championship uh, team last year, one that capable of winning it, and the offense clearly was, and the defense obviously wasn't. We don't have to continue to harp on that, <laughs> but it's um, it goes to, to just show like that. That's where their mind's been at. Now it's about, and you know, so you're hearing the right things in terms of where their mind's at, what they're trying to accomplish, how they're going about doing it. Now it's about, act, you know, they, they got to execute on those right. things. You know, um, it's great to say you want to be better than 10 and 2 um, and, and to try to take that next step forward. Um, that kind of sets the stage for what they're going to go try to accomplish this year. But it, now they really hear throughout the spring and throughout the preseason camp and into the fall, you know, they've got to be able to address their their issues. And, and that's probably what we'll get into now. Obviously, well, we can't see a game until, what, like August, September. But September 1st? September 1st. The yeah, September 1st. Um, Labor Day Sunday. But have you seen anything sort of different since you've been out there at the, some of these yeah. spring practices? Have you seen anything that's, different? Yeah. That was going to be our next topic, which is uh, <laughs> uh, the offense in particular, uh, which is uh, you got a sneaking suspicion, Wilson, that we might see more 12 personnel, one running back, two tight ends, two receivers. Not even a sneaking suspicion. Mason Taylor said that we will. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, coming straight from the tight end's mouth, that there will be more tight ends on the field. Um that was kind of the main thing from him yesterday was um, that this offense will be more in 12 personnel. And um, that's not a surprise. It's kind of what we thought would happen is there's going to be more usage of the tight ends um, because you don't have, you know, Jaden Daniels legs as the outlet. Now that your outlet is probably your tight ends or your running backs in the flat. Um, you also don't have Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas as these established receivers stretching the field. Else, you might ha- be able to replicate the the vertical passing game the way it did last year. We'll have to, we'll have to see, um, but you you don't know that that's going to necessarily be there. I, I think it will be because mm-hmm. you've got Garrett Nussmeyer who loves to throw the ball deep. You've got guys like Chris Hilton who can stretch the field vertically. Yes. Um, but you know you don't because the offense is going to be changing based on its personnel. The tight ends are going to be a bigger piece of that, and so. And you've you got know, the right personnel at tight end to be able to do it now, too. Potentially, anyway. Yes. You know, Mason, now he's, we were talking to him yesterday, and he's now going into a year three where he said himself, like, his last season didn't meet expectations. And it didn't end up really mattering for the offense because yeah. you had Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas and Kyron Lacey. Two top 15 picks. Received, exactly. Right. Like, you didn't necessarily need a whole lot out of Mason Taylor, but you're probably going to need more out of Mason Taylor this year. And um, he wants to have a better season. Last year, he was hampered by the ankle at times. Um, but he said that, you know, he just needed to do a lot of things better. And it sounded like kind of listening to his comments in totality, like he knows that he needs to be better to make sure that the quarterback will trust him. In this case, Garrett will trust him mm-hmm. when he needs to make a play that he can go to Mason Taylor. And I think you started sort of saw some signs of that chemistry in the bowl game with Mason having seven catches for 88 yards, both season highs. And so, you know, as Mason kind of goes into year three, you've got him having had two solid seasons, now wanting to take that next step. 
You've also got Mac Markway back, and this will be his second spring in the program. Um, he's certainly, you know, established himself as somebody who's capable of run blocking, and in 12 personnel, you're going to need that. But can he do a little bit more as a receiver? Mm -hmm. And then the big one, the two that are, you know, intriguing, and one of them is on campus right now, is Camorian Pimpton. You know, can he become more of a threat and an actual weapon in this offense? Because the catch radius is absurd. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's things that he needed to continue to work on. One, physicality at the line of scrimmage to be able to be involved in these 12 personnel sets because a lot of that will be lined up kind of in line around the line of scrimmage. You'll have some guys split out too, mm -hmm. uh, from, you know, as well in those 12 personnel sets depending on what they end up looking like. Um, but he's got to be able to do both. And he's also, in terms of his route running, Mason said, um, just needs to get a little bit more like, what was it exactly that he said? It was like the coaches are trying to make sure that Camorian kind of like, like runs all the way through his routes and, and is sort of like, they're just kind of working with him on his route running. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of another st step in his evolution. And um, then, you know, this summer, Trey Des Green will come on campus and come preseason camp will be fascinating to see how else he tries to use him, a guy who's six seven and, and can really run and can jump out of the, out of the gym because of his bas basketball background. And so that's where LSU set up at tight end. And those pieces are intriguing. I think everybody needs to get better. Um, but if they do, then yeah. LSU will be able to use these 12 personnel sets to their advantage. And part of the reason why I think the 12 personnel thing is so interesting is because they also, like, they don't have Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas anymore, but they still have, what, like, 9, 10 scholarship receivers. <laughs> and what are you going to do with all those different scholarship guys? And it's not like they don't have talent. All these guys have talent, right? They all have the ability to start for a, a team like LSU or for LSU someday. How do you sort of, you know, give those guys potential time, if they're especially if they're ready, when you also have the option to play more 12 personnel it's like it's a great problem to have but i do think it's interesting if you're going to go more 12 it does actually cut off opportunities for you know not even just like the chris hilton's and the aaron anderson's of the world but like the the kyle parker's and the shelton samson's of the world while you're also adding a xavion thomas and uh cj daniels to play right away well, I mean, that's the brilliant thing about the offense is that, like, you could see more 12 personnel sets because LSU barely ran them, ran them at all yes. last year, even though that was part of what they wanted to do philosophically on offense under Mike Dimbrock and really comes down from Brian Kelly, who really likes to do that. They've done it since their Notre Dame, his Notre Dame days. Um, but even though you necessarily maybe want to do more of that, it doesn't have to be the only thing. Like, LSU will still go three wide and still yes. go four wide at times even. and Or you can go, like, four wide with um, – you know, two tight ends on the field, maybe like, mm -hmm. and that yeah. kind of gets to what you're talking about, maybe like with ta possibly taking out some targets for your receivers, but it all goes into kind of what you have to do during the spring and even into preseason camp is figure out what your strengths are. Yeah. Last year's strength was the vertical passing game and Jaden Daniels legs and these receivers. And so like you didn't use 12 personnel hardly because it wasn't your strength. Um, this year, uh, they have to find out what that strength is. Joe Sloan now in his first year as the offensive coordinator, that's what he's got to locate here in the spring. And you know, we've hardly seen much of practice, really. Um, I mean, we've seen a total of now 40 minutes of individual drills, which is not enlightening for anybody who has not seen individual drills. It's great to go out there. Don't get me wrong. Thank you, LSU, for giving us access. Please don't take it away. But um, it doesn't tell you exactly a whole lot of what's truly going on. Right. Within those individual drills, we've seen the offense run some full uh, stuff on air. And it's always been actually 11 personnel with one running back, one tight end, and three wide receivers. And that seems to maybe be kind of their base. Um, but as they go deeper into the playbook, that seems to, I think, maybe be the different, the differ, the difference this year could be that there'll be more usage of 12 personnel, but it's not going to be exclusively what they're running and, out of. And my guess is the same drills, right? Oh, yeah. As oh, of course. Two years oh, ago. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the same, especially to... Um, sort of the 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 regular eye it looks uh fairly similar in terms of like the drills that they're running and that kind of thing but although there is this difference is that uh right off the bat you can see Corey raymond working on press man coverage with the corners which is i think a a little refreshing, refreshing thing yes. for lsu fans after the <laughs> last season in particular uh, uh no more zone yes yeah, <laughs> well there could well, zone, be, not as be much, zone but not you've as got, much zone you've got at least the potential to be able to uh to, to do man press we don't know that for sure but certainly we'll they're, gonna, they're gonna do their best they're gonna do their level best and they've got plenty of numbers uh to throw at the throw at the problem so to speak speaking of numbers wilson i know well, you were you've only seen mm -hmm. 40 minutes worth but uh, you made mention of uh, uh some different players that have gotten reps about well, receivers who have gotten first uh, first team reps yeah i was gonna say because it was building right off of what um cookie just brought up you know they got a ton of receivers um at this point and, and that's one of the main storylines of the off season is you know how does this receiver room take shape um what we've seen at this point is that Two kind of mainstays, uh, guys who I think are really going to be pushing uh, for significant roles in there are Kyle, 
excuse me, Kyron Lacey and Chris Hilton. Mm -hmm. um, Kyron comes back as your most experienced returning receiver. Yep. It would make sense that at this point he's wide receiver one. LSU has been releasing some, you know, clips of uh, some sort of highlight kind of catches that he's made over the first couple of weeks of, of spring ball. And Garrett said that's pretty representative of what Kyron has done so far. It's not just like social media fodder. You're hearing right. that from the quarterback who's actually saying like, yeah, this is kind of what he's looked like at this, at this point. Um, but also, you know, Chris Hilton has uh, been running with the ones from what we from again, from this little tiny snippet that we've seen. Um, trying to parse through social media clips that LSU releases from practice, you can also tell that they're <laughs> rotating a good mm -hmm. bit. And it seems like the top six at this point, which is probably the best way to look at it, because especially throughout the spring, they're going to rotate a lot, is really um, Kyron Lacey, Chris Hilton, uh, Kyle Parker. You mentioned the redshirt freshman. He was with the first team offense from the little bit that we saw at practice on Wednesday. And then Xavier Thomas, C.J. Daniels, and Aaron Anderson. Okay. Um, and C.J. Daniels and Xavier Thomas, it's going back to what Brian Kelly said a couple of weeks ago when spring practice first started, like they were brought in as kind of their replacements for Malik and right. Brian Thomas. Not necessarily like doing the exact same things, but replacements for that but level of they're experience. The, right, they're the plan right now guys. Exactly. So like they're going to get their shot at this. Like just because what we've seen so far there on the second team offense like has – no bearing over what this is going to actually turn into. There's such a long way to go. And, and they're expected to come in. I mean, CJ Daniels was a thousand yard receiver last year. So th that's kind of like your top six. And I think that's probably what's kind of interesting right now is because like, that's not a list that includes Shelton Sampson, um, a guy who mm -hmm. is very highly touted coming out of high school, but from everything that we, you know, again, the very little that we've seen so far, he was with that third team offense. Mm -hmm. And when you've got maybe a good number of receivers ahead of you, like he's got to continue to get better. Right. Brian Kelly talked about this right when camp opened. He was asked about Shelton, and he said that he's somebody who, once he can get downfield and use his height and his length, he's really hard to stop. He's got to get better at his releases off the line of scrimmage and at kind of shedding the hands that can get a corner can get on him in order to be able to then use that stuff downfield. So he's kind of it's all kind of comes back to physicality for him. He's got to be able to let that part of his game um, improve. Here over this spring that's going to be critical for him throughout the offseason so he can be a bigger part of this offense because there's opportunity for him um a guy who actually doesn't yet have a college catch to maybe at least work his way into the rotation here in year two um and so but at the moment it seems like that top six like we said is 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 what it is um and shelton's got to kind of break into that we'll start to get a better idea of it though throughout the spring i think maybe the most notable most notable development is kyle parker kind of putting himself into the mix. Because at this point, I wouldn't count on any, right. they don't count on anybody at this point. Right. But it's, it is interesting that Kyle seems to be, um, you know, getting some reps with the ones. And with Sheldon, he kind of gives them a different look than a lot of the other receivers that they have. You know, that vertical, like, true X sort of guy who, you know, uses his height to, you know, pluck balls out of thin air, basically. The same, like, Kamari Pinton, but as a receiver. Another, yeah, know? another guy who looks the part. Yeah, I mean, yes. he's like, what, I think he's like 6'4". Mm -hmm. And... Um, the next closest to that, which would make him the tallest receiver on the team, if I'm not mistaken. And right underneath that is CJ Daniels and Kyron Lace here, about, both about 6'2". Um, and so they kind of are in that similar mold. But, yeah, I mean, Shelton has the body type in some ways uh, more like Brian Thomas, you know, in terms of, like, the height and the length. Um, whereas, yeah, like a guy like Kyle Parker who's in the same class, um, his body type is just a little bit different. He's a little bit shorter, a little bit maybe more compact. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, we actually saw him kind of lined up on the outside. Okay. That's typical for LSU receivers. If they can do it, they're going to move around a lot in their formation to get matchups. Um, but that was interesting else. That was the other interesting part of it. You know how much we saw, you know, Malik Neighbors in particular um, line up out of the slot last year. Well, they had Kyron Lacey kind of working on some slot stuff uh, at practice on Wednesday. And if he can make that sort of step to become somebody who this was part of what made Malik so hard to defend was he could move him around all over the place. If Kyron can kind of get to that in his game, which Malik would always say last year, like all of them can do it. Um, it but if he really can kind of take that on, then that could help him, you know, kind of have a, a, a really good season. There's a lot to uh, a lot to sort through before LSU and you're right LSU, before LSU's first game against uh, USC, which is indeed September 1st, 6:30 p.m. in Las Vegas. Which I guess now I'm thinking about it'll be the first well it'll be the first regular season game, not uh, counting exhibitions uh, since the Super Bowl in that in that building, which I did not think about until just mm. now. But uh, and USC's first game in the Big Ten and yeah yeah uh, LSU is going to try to win the Big Ten the Big Ten Western Front it's probably uh, next LSU's year. LSU's first ever game in Las Vegas too, right? Oh, 
it uh, probably. I mean, unless that. they played UNLV back in well, 1975 you can go bet on it while or something. While you're in Las Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the tw- so we know about the 2024 schedule, and we now, as of uh, 24 hours ago or thereabouts, we know at least a, a good bit about the 2025 schedule, which I think was probably a little bit of. I don't know if it was a surprise, but certainly. Why did they announce that on the eve of March Madness? I who well maybe that's a news dump. You know, maybe uh, that's yeah, telling maybe, in and of itself. Maybe uh, they 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 didn't want to get uh, lambasted over. Uh, yeah. Oh, over at uh, you know in, on May 14th or whatever uh, whatever uh, whatever time the uh, the spring meeting is uh, over over in the Florida Panhandle, uh, but so we know that the SEC at least for one more year uh, after 2024 we all thought that 2024 was okay we'll just play this eight game schedule and figure out the opponents as a stopgap measure until Texas and OU come in and then we'll sort of parse everything out and the SEC you know, presidents, chancellors, ADs will all, you know, get in the octagon and try to figure out whether they can uh, agree on a nine game schedule and permanent opponents and all those types of things. And come to find out they decided to kick it down the road at least one more year. Um, The SEC is going to play eight conference games again in 2025. Uh, And what they will do is flip the home and away teams from what they had in 2024. So for LSU in 25, uh, they will play Arkansas, Florida, South Carolina, Texas A&M at home. On the road, they will play at Alabama, at Ole Miss, at Oklahoma for the first time, and at Vanderbilt, which is always a nice road game for an SEC team to go into Nashville, get what is presumably a much easier win than usual in conference, and uh, and take it home with them. But uh, long story short, and you know this this is these are all opinions, and everybody's got one, just like they have certain other body parts. But the long story short is that we don't we all believe, or certainly in this in this town in this state, it's kind of disappointing. You know, most of these other conferences have gone to nine games, and SEC, come on, guys, what, what, what's the holdup here? The best conference We're, not utilizing, utilizing the fact that it is the best conference. That's what it kind of looks like to me. Yeah, so, I mean, like certainly in terms it, of it hasn't caught up to, it, Yeah, right. I mean, like the Big Ten has already kind of gone into this route, and yeah, it's like the SEC is sort of dragging its heels on going ahead and going to nine games. Apparently, this, this was kind of the expectation for this year. We actually even heard it from Chris Del Conte, the Texas Athletic Director, last month. You know, indicate publicly that this was going to be. Um, probably what happened in 2025 and then in 2026 is when they might really focus on implementing a nine game schedule. Um, And so that makes, you know, some sense, you know, in 2026 is when um, there'll be a new television contract with the college football playoff. Mm -hmm. Um, You'll also at that point, um, potentially there might be 14 college football playoff spots at that point. There's talk of expanding the playoff again, which I think is a bad idea, but that's a a separate conversation. Um, And, so maybe that's why uh, they're doing right. this. It also seems like by doing the exact same opponents in 2025, you may set yourself up to very easily go to nine conference opponents in 2026. Um, and then at that point, really change the schedule. But it is like just kind of deflating because mm-hmm. it's like, OK, you know, it will be cool for LSU to go play in Norman, Oklahoma for the first time. Um, but it also would have been cool for them to play somebody else from the SEC East. Would have like, been, or, or would have been cool for Texas to come finish off. The, it would not have been an actual payoff of the home-and-home home series yeah. that they were supposed to play, but would have been nice. would be nice to see Texas come in here for the first time since, like, I don't know, 1953 or something like that. Or, heck, LSU, Georgia, you know? Make it happen, yeah. regular season. Why not? Sure, sure. It'd be that's, fun. That's kind of what I'm referencing, like, by, like a yeah. different SEC East team. Because, yes. like, you get South Carolina now in back-to-back years, which is – like not the juicy kind of eastern opponent that you're used to. Of course, right. SEC East and West won't exist at this point. It was but fun for one year. It'll but kind of, yeah, yeah. It, it's cool. I think it's going to be cool to go. You know, see a game in Williams Bryce Stadium for LSU fans. That especially if it's a night game, that place gets raucous mm-hmm. as they start playing Sandstorm and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, them coming back to Tiger Stadium. You know, they played in Tiger Stadium a couple of years ago. Yep. Um, I think it was during the COVID year. Well, T.J. Finley was the quarterback in LSU one. That game, Jesus, but it that was right? man. I don't have any. Yeah. Well, I guess Muschamp was still coaching the team. Is that right? Well, now, now I don't know about now. I don't know that part. I don't remember that. <laughs> I just remember TJ Finley and. Um, well, I was trying to forget that yeah. year. I think. Jeez. And uh, <laughs> anyway, the um, now so now they played South Carolina a good bit, and it just doesn't really have the kind of. It's, it doesn't mm, have the same oomph as Georgia yeah. would. Another point about this 2025 schedule. Um, so LSU's also got actually, although you got the Vanderbilt game on the road. That road schedule is kind of where all the big time stuff is. And when you talk 100%. about like the big names, you go in two Ole Miss, which is you know a competitive team the last few years under Lane. You go in two Alabama, 
Uh, and then you obviously, again, to Oklahoma. And we don't know what these teams will look like in 2025, but those are like some big, juicy names. And you start the season at Clemson. Right. And so that and that's really what kind of pushes it over the edge is the road schedule being a little bit more tough than it seems to be um, this upcoming season, where I think LSU's toughest games are probably going to be at home. Uh, we will uh, we will see about that. But it, it does. I, I got to say it does. You know, I, I would think. My, my feeling all along, and maybe it's been misguided, uh, but my feeling all along was that TV at some point, ESPN, ABC, and Disney, were going to come into the SEC and say, hey, look, guys, you added two more teams in Texas and Oklahoma. We don't have to give you one red cent for these two extra teams. That's okay. We're, but we're, we're willing. We as a TV network, a, a broadcasting company, we're okay with giving you more money, but you got to give us better games. you got to give us more inventory. We're, we we're, we didn't give you this whole big pile of money to to broadcast Alabama versus Chattanooga, yeah. or for that matter, LSU versus Chattanooga or whatever. You know, you want to see these big time games. And again, this is something that the Big Ten has adopted, and the Big Twelve, and and most other most other conferences. I mean, they, why are they we getting mom- all this conference movement in the first place? It's because of these TV networks. So it right. is surprising that that change hasn't like radically changed the the you know the scheduling outlook for the SEC. And, and may yet still. But yeah. they, they it will probably ter- eventually, but yeah. surprise doesn't happen quicker, I right. guess. To remind people of some of the issues at hand, or there's you know a fair number of non-conference games that are even scheduled that mm-hmm. uh, teams would have to move. LSU actually moved a game against Rice, um, kind of in anticipation of playing a nine-game conference schedule. It would have been this, um, what was, I guess, it would have been in this upcoming season. They yes. moved it to 2029, 20, um, and now they actually have to go and find another non-conference game. They've got right. 11 games now. They got to go find another one to fill out that schedule. Which, which means, in all likelihood, at this late date, you're going to end up with exactly what we're talking about. You yeah. know, some sort of middling conference. You at Sam Houston State or whoever. But so, so that's a, an issue. And the TV thing, you know, the SEC, uh, you know, actually wants more money to then to go play nine games. Right. And so right. that's a, an issue as well. And. Um, and so they're trying to, I think, you know, those things still have to get worked through, but like you said, I think for everybody, it's just sort of like, okay, well, uh, we're going to keep waiting <laughs> when they've been, you know, talking about nine games and not doing it for years. In, in a lot of ways, I mean, from a strategic standpoint, it is in some way, I mean, nobody wants to hear this, but it is in some ways advantageous for the SEC to stay this way, you know, in, in for, for so many years, you know, we know, we, we have come to know and dread, not come to know and love, but to come to come to know and dread that second to last week of the season before Thanksgiving where, you know, I'm just going to make up, a you know, Ohio State's playing Wisconsin or whoever in the Big Ten, and then that's that, you know, that's that tomato can week for all the teams in the SEC. And, from as again, from a strategic standpoint, well, okay, if you're Ohio State, Wisconsin might knock you off and knock you out of the playoff race. If you're an SEC team and you're playing a tomato can, well, that's one less chance for you to get upset and get knocked out of the race. So that's it's true. Yeah. it's in some ways understandable, but again, it, it also you know in some ways it's also TV is most of your revenue. I understand that, but at some point it's going to cost you at the gate, and you're going to look out at that you know sea of empty seats on the uh, on the Upper East Side of Tiger Stadium and say, well, gee whiz. You know, wish we'd have figured out something else to do. Let's see if we can't hammer this through and get Tennessee in here or something like that. So, uh, anyway, we will we will um, we will keep an eye on all that as as we go down the road. We, we've got plenty to keep an eye on, obviously, as we as we continue to go down the road here. Cokie's going to have another long weekend at the box, uh, but. It's an enjoyable weekend. Oh, Cokie's a steam head, so it's, it's, it's a all base, good. It's, it's a weekend of baseball. Like, what's better than that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, well, it depends on the weather. I don't know. That's true. Oh, it's supposed to be lovely on Saturday. Yeah. Um, and Sunday, too, I think, will be fine. I think Friday, Friday it should clear up by the time. By the time pitch. the game starts, yeah. it should clear up. A little, little yeah. dicey, but... but uh, We've had that happen the last couple of weeks. It never rains at Alec Box Stadium. That's true. <laughs> it's Tiger Stadium. Yes. Uh, Wilson, will, of course, will keep an eye on spring football. Fully open spring practice on Saturday. Yeah. So there will be a lot more to glean from that instead of just you know, some individual periods. What better way to spend a weekend? Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. So many great ways to spend your weekend. You yeah, know? there's a lot right. of sports hey. going on. Right? Yeah. No, it's we fantastic. We didn't even mention the Co- tournament. College football yeah. is college football. That's right. These two gentlemen will be taking care of baseball and football. Uh, Reed Darcy and Scott Rabelais will be at the women's basketball first two rounds. Uh, again, if you did not catch our, our previous podcast on Monday, we did a pretty full breakdown on the NCAA women's tournament. 
uh, talked a little about the NCAA men's tournament, but uh, obviously locally here, the uh, the LSU women are front and center. Their first two games, uh, presumably their first two games, will be here at the PMAC on Friday and Sunday. Uh, again, you can go see our uh, our Monday podcast to break that down and to follow along with that, with gymnastics and with softball as well. So, uh, again, plenty to plenty to keep your arms around uh, at LSU uh, pretty much at all times, but certainly in the spring uh, to stay up to date with it. You can uh, you can. By all means, you can sign up for our LSU newsletter and stay up to date with all of it. Get it all sent to your inbox. Uh, and to sign up for that uh, for that LSU newsletter, you go to theadvocate.com slash LSU newsletter. Please subscribe to The Advocate, of course, uh, whether that's in print or digital. Uh, support your local journalist. Please go to theadvocate.com slash subscribe. We are here every Monday and Thursday again uh, on the LSU Sports Insider on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever the finer podcasts are found. And, of course, we are here on all our social channels, specifically the YouTube channel, LSU Tigers on NOLA.com. We are always there live on Mondays and Thursdays. If you don't catch us there live, you can catch us there after the fact at any time. So please subscribe to that YouTube channel as well. And, of course, we are brought to you by Champion Wealth Strategies. It's been a great sponsor for us all year long. Uh, to, to find out more about Champion Wealth Strategies, please go to championwealthstrategies.com. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Baseball and football and plenty more to go as we go down the road. For Cokie Riley, for Wilson Alexander, for Amelia Cotton behind the glass. I'm Perrin Keys. This is the LSU Sports Insider.